All right, welcome. We are going to start into Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 8. And tonight's focus will be on when Jesus shows up. When Jesus shows up. Um, and this is when, in the text, Jesus shows up in uh, Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 9. I want to open up, though, with a bit of an intro here. Have you ever wondered what Jesus looked like when he walked on this earth? I'm not interested in some artistic uh, depiction there or some Renaissance painter who conceives him as a blonde, blue-eyed European, nor am I intrigued by modern fantasies that feminize our Lord and neuter him. I do often wonder what did the Lord really look like? And the prophet Isaiah has an interesting perspective in Isaiah 53 verses 2 and 3 where it says he has no form or splendor. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. It's not a pretty picture. It doesn't really provide much help. To be honest, we need to acknowledge that we really don't know what Jesus looked like when he walked on the earth. So that comes from Danny Aiken. And so here's a second question. Would you like to know what Jesus looks like now? The Jesus of today, resurrected, ascended, glorified, and majestic. Well, we do have good news. Three times in Revelation, we're given a magnification and breathtaking portrait of our heavenly king. They appear in our text tonight, also in chapter 5, 1 through 14, and chapter 19, 11 through 21. They're not identical, but they are complementary. And they are not intended to be exhaustive and literal, but descriptive and pictorial, as they provide a glimpse of the glorified Christ in his appearance, apparel, and authority. Who at any moment, any place, any time, or any day, or any situation, he's all we need. And so, praise God, we get some of these glimpses. John understood our need to catch a glimpse and to see anew the glorified Christ, especially when times are tough and particular crises overtake us. John found himself in just this kind of situation, exiled as a political prisoner to the rock quarry island of Patmos. Here in chapter 1, 9 through 20, John was privileged to see the Lord in all of his splendor, and he gives us a vivid description of Jesus. And so let's read it. It's John, uh, Revelation, sorry, chapter 1, 9 through 11 here. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his waist, his chest. Uh, the hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it as it is fired in a furnace and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun in full strength. All right, so that's the first uh, few verses there. Uh, we've got, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, let's keep going, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, next verse. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So that, fin that finishes out the, the text for today. We're finishing up really chapter one. So after tonight, we will have finished uh, one full chapter of Revelation. But let's take a closer look right now at John before Jesus shows up. Let's, let's study what John's up to and what he's doing. John had been faithful to preach the word of God and proclaim the testimony of Jesus Christ. What was his reward? Well, it got him thrown in jail and sent away to die alone. Patmos was a 10 by 6 mile mountainous island in the Aegean Sea, about 70 miles 
uh, west southwest from Ephesus off the coast of Asia Minor. It was in, in essence a penal colony for exiled criminals banished and sentenced to hard labor in the, war, the rock quarries there. I'm gonna, um, I'm seeing two folks here in the waiting room. I'm gonna admit them if I can. Hang on a, a minute. Okay. Um, There we go. Let me admit these in. Welcome folks. Okay. Let me go back to the screen share guys. Sorry about that. Let me take you to the island of Patmos right now. Let's go ahead and look at it. The island of Patmos is about seven miles from north to south at its, at its widest. It's about five miles at its narrowest, a mere few hundred yards. So it's got a few narrow zones. This is the famous church, uh, the Cave of the Apocalypse, where if you go to Patmos today, it's a very famous tourist destination where tradition says that John wrote his letter at this location. It's hard to know historically uh, really where on the island John wrote. But if you look above the door, you have this nice uh, little image there of uh, John dictating the letter to, as church tradition says, not the Bible. He, he wrote, uh, he had this writer named Prochorus, according to church tradition, who sat inside the cave where John was staying. Such a scene, though, that we're seeing here does not come to us from scripture, but from a fifth century legend called the Acts of the Holy Apostle and Evangelist, John the Theologian. And so in that book, which I don't believe is, is genuine and true, of course, uh, they have a story of Procreus writing it as John dictates the letter. And so um, that's kind of from that legend, that's where this image shows up. In 12th century, uh, the monastery of St. John was built. It stands on the site that once was occupied by a temple. And as you look across the skyline, that's kind of the tallest thing on the island now is this monastery of St. John. So his influence today on the island, um, if you're able to make it to Patmos, is huge. Well, let's take a, a closer look here. Pliny the Elder, who is a church historian, he says of exiles, similar to what John would have experienced, he says that they were thrown together into any ship that could be found and such as escape the dangers of the waves and storms and reach the place assigned for their habitation. They found there nothing but bare rocks and an inhospitable rugged shore where they had to pass a life of hardship and misery. W.M. Ramsey says that many of the Christians suffered the harsh treatment described by Pliny. He says that many Christians were punished in that way. It was a penalty for humbler criminals, provincials and slaves. It was in the worst form, a terrible fate like the death penalty, it was preceded by scourging. That's where they would whip your back. And it was marked by perpetual fetters. Those are locks, scanty clothing, insufficient food, sleep on the bare ground in a dark prison, and work under the lash of military overseers. It is an unavoidable conclusion that this was St. John's punishment. And so we see this as a persecution of Christians broke out in the Roman Empire about AD 90. This is the uh, decade we believe that John wrote the letter. Originally, it was directed against Jews who refused to pay a tax to Jupiter. Being associated with Judaism in the minds of many, Christians also suffered during this persecution. And Domitian, who ruled from AD 81 to 96, loved to be addressed as Dominus, et Deus, which is Lord and God. And so he found eager support for emperor worship in the province of Asia. Participation in this worship became a mark of loyalty to the empire. Domitian generally enforced emperor worship, and upon refusal to participate in this, Christians were charged with treason. According to church tradition, when Domitian was put to death in AD 96, John returned to Ephesus and died around AD 100, a natural death. John had been faithful to Jesus, and apparently it had not paid off. Look where it got him again, but don't miss it. Look where it, what it got him. As he suffered for Jesus, John gained insight into the ways of God, that he could not have gotten in, in, in no other way. And so let's look at a little bit more here. Before Jesus showed up, this is a simple outline before we get into the, the main point of the passage, which is Jesus showing up. John was obviously suffering. He was in a, a rough place. And so let's go into the text here. And, and so John learned that there is a partnership in suffering for Jesus. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction. John has brothers and partners. He's not alone. He's no lone ranger. His Lord had suffered. His brother James was martyred. Paul and Peter were dead. Antipas had, had been killed. 
chapter 213, you can read about him. Many share in the partnership of suffering then and today. Today, that suffering has increased uh, so much that there are more in the last 100 years that have suffered and martyred, been martyred for the faith than in the first 1900 years combined. And so we see that playing out in our day, especially today in the nation of China. John also learned there is pain in suffering for Jesus because he said he is a partner in the affliction. And so this is a pressure, trouble, tribulation. Afflictions need not sad, sidetrack our walk with Jesus Christ. John, like Peter, Paul, and the Lord, received his greatest revelation and climbed his highest spiritual mountain during a time of extreme suffering and persecution for Christ. God's pain always bring, brings gain. In 2 Timothy 3.12, it's a verse we've quoted quite a bit in our study of Peter. It reminds us, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, third thing about John is uh, there is a praise in his suffering. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction and kingdom. Uh, the kingdom there, the Greek word is basilia. We get, uh, you know, a few words from that word. Basilica is one of them. Jesus inaugurated his kingdom as a suffering savior. We enter the kingdom and serve as suffering saints and the pain and the praise do go together. Reigning and suffering are not mutually exclusive. It's the way of our Lord. It's also to be our way. We do share now today in his royalty, power, and kingdom. And yes, there's tribulation, but there's also a kingdom there. And so the next word here is endurance. There's patience in the suffering for Jesus here. Uh, the word for endurance, you see it there. And it just means to abide under a heavy load, to persevere, to stay with it, uh, to hang in there, to not throw in the towel or drop out of the race. You know this verse, James 1, 4, let, let patience have its perfect and complete work. And so God, through companionship, tribulation, and glory, is training us and is preparing us for heaven. He is a faithful father who will never give up on us. And so there is this patient endurance. And then all of this, of course, is in Jesus as we work through this verse. It's according to his will, his plan, that, that whatever befell John was all according to what Jesus said would take place. John's exile to Patmos was no accident. It did not catch God by surprise. Any more than any crisis or tribulation we face today would catch him off guard or unprepared, praise God. It is in Christ, of Christ, and for Christ. And Christ will provide the needed strength for John and for us to endure extreme trials and suffering that come out of uh, come out of it all victorious conquerors. That's our, our end plan and goal there. So before Jesus showed up, we're also told in the next verse, John was in the spirit. So he was suffering first, and then he's in the spirit. Look at the verse, verse 10. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet. Now, there are four times in Revelation we're going to see that little phrase, in the spirit. This is not a normal state. It's a supernatural state in the book of Revelation for John. It's an ecstatic condition. It's, it's in this condition that John sees the revelation, that he sees it. So nothing in the text indicates John sought this. It was a divine seizing of John by God. John did not resist it, but he gave himself over to the sovereign control of God for his purpose in his life. And so I'd say John's experience with the Holy Spirit in this book is different than our personal experience, but all of us must yield our hearts and lives over daily and moment by moment to the, the work of the Holy Spirit that we would be used of God for his purposes in this life, just the same. So um, he was worshiping on the Lord's day. It says in verse 10 there, here he is on the Lord's day. And this is where he heard a loud voice like a trumpet. The Lord's day is Sunday or, or Easter Sunday. We believe historically it was the day of the Lord where Jesus arose. It was a day of worship for the early church. And John was in church, not the building for that is not necessary, but in the spirit who occupies all who belong to Jesus. Now, I encourage, we all strongly encourage, go to church, attend church if you're able to do so. But if you're unable, if you're in prison, you can worship. And the big rule that, that Rick and I teach all the time is worship is not a one-hour event on a Sunday morning. It's every day of every life. Whatever you are doing, do it all to the glory of God. And you can worship God as you uh, do your job and as you drive on I-4. It was Resurrection Day, and John was present to worship the Lord in all aspects and avenues of life. Uh, enjoy the Spirit's control. That's Ephesians 5.18. Don't get drunk with wine, but be controlled or be filled by the Holy Spirit. And so before Jesus was seen, John heard the Savior's command. He heard the voice of Jesus uh, before he saw Jesus. And so look at this. He had a voice, a loud voice, like a trumpet. 
Uh, this is the way John describes the voice of Jesus. What a different voice John heard on this day from that which he had heard almost 70 years before this. Then it was an earthly Jesus, now it's a heavenly son of God. This was the humbled savior, or then it was, and then now it's the exalted son of man. So here he is in his full uh, glory and, and power. And so he says this, verse 11, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. You have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So write on the scroll what you see and send it there. These seven churches were especially dear to the heart of God and to the heart of John. These were actual historical churches in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. The number seven would also indicate their representative nature of the various types of churches that exist through the history of the church. So you're gonna find application in the seven churches that we're gonna start next Wednesday, you're gonna find one that might identify very, very closely to South Orlando Baptist Church or whatever church you might be attending. If you're not in our church, Revelation 1.11 says, write it on the scroll, same verse, um, Christ had a word then and he has a word now for his churches. He tells John to write and write he does. One of the most magnificent books of all time. When we obey the Savior's command, we can count on the results being nothing less than supernatural. It was true for John, and it's also true for us when he commands us. And so now we are at the, the heart of the message today, when Jesus shows up. And so this is the primary outline here, uh, working through our passage. Jesus is now present in the, the passage, and when he shows up, we see his activity as point number one. When Jesus shows up, see his activity. And this is where he turns and he sees a voice. Uh, he sees who, who, who it was that spoke to him. When he turned, he saw seven golden lampstands. And so let's talk about those. The seven golden lampstands. Moses constructed a seven-branched lampstand for the tabernacle in the book of Exodus. Zechariah had a vision of a seven-branched golden lampstand, which was said to be the eyes of the Lord, which ranged throughout the earth in Zechariah 4 verse 10. Revelation 1.20, in our passage, we'll get to this a bit later, it tells us that they are the seven churches. As lampstands, they held small oil lamps, and from them came light, God's light, which was to go out to a dark and evil world. For us, the assignment is the exact same. So the seven golden lampstands represent the seven churches, and we are told that explicitly and clearly in Revelation 1, verse 20. It's the clearest explanation of, of the interpretation of this verse. And you see it there in verse 20. And so as he sees the seven golden lampstands, look at verse 13, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man. John also saw a person among the lampstands. His identity is no secret. It's the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus. Both his title and his location are very significant. The title, Son of Man, goes back to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. This is Jesus favorite self-designation, and it occurs 81 times in the Gospels. So when Jesus speaks of himself, he loves to use that phrase, the Son of Man. It identifies him as the heavenly Messiah, who is also human, who will receive a kingdom. And so that's what the title means. And then look at where he's at. He's among the lampstands, which we know are the churches. And so when you look at his location, he's in the midst, in the middle, in the center of the lampstands. He is there he is with them. They are not alone. They are not forgotten. He knows what they are going through, and he's in their midst. He is watching, and he is working in the midst of his churches. Though they may fail him, he will not fail them, for he is in their midst, among them, and with them. And so I think that's a beautiful thing to see, his activity. Uh, the second thing we want to look at is survey his features, and this is the, the majority of what John focuses on now are the features of Jesus when he uh, takes in Christ and, and just a full gaze looks upon him. He says that he's dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. And so Jesus is seen clothed here in the apparel of a prophet, a priest, and a king. And John saw the unveiled, glorified, and exalted Jesus as he truly is in his glorified state. Um, so let's dive into some of these things. Dressed in a robe, with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. This was the dress of a priest in the Old Testament as seen in Exodus 28, verse 4. And so look at this verse with me, Exodus 28, verse 4. These are the garments that they must make, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a specially woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make holy garments 
for your brother Aaron and his sons that they may serve me as priests. And so this signifies Jesus as our great high priest and points to his work of atonement and intercession of, on our behalf. Um, so let's keep looking at a few other things here. The hair of his head was as white as wool or white as snow and his eyes were a fiery flame. For his, the hair of his head to be white as wool, that shows infinite divine wisdom. And so you'll find throughout the Old Testament, there are verses that refer to the wisdom of someone with white hair. Um, so if you have white hair tonight, you're apparently wise according to scripture. God bless you. Dr. Danny Aiken sees five attributes of Jesus from this small phrase, white as wool. And the first one here is it can refer to purity and character. Uh, number two is dignity of his person, authority as a judge, because uh, in his wisdom, he will be judging from his wisdom, eternality in his existence. He's the ancient of days in Daniel 7, 9, and then excellency in his wisdom. And so those are some attributes from this one phrase that Dan Dr. Aiken seemed to uh, stretch out there from that. Well, let's look at some Old Testament connections. I'll be showing these throughout tonight's study as we continue. So you have the hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow. Daniel himself in the Old Testament had a vision where he saw, just like John, he saw Jesus. And so this is the description Daniel gives us in Daniel 7, verse 9 of the Old Testament. As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head like whitest wool. And so you can see a, a comparison verse here. His throne was a flaming, uh, flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. And so this overlaps a bit with what Daniel saw of Jesus. As we keep going on, it says that his eyes were like a fiery flame. And so his insights are penetrating. He sees through everything. You know, he's, he has this omniscient intelligence in fiery holiness. The true condition of, of each church, each Christian is transparent to the gaze of his eyes. He's able to see through everything. And this is something we also see um, as we look uh, onward uh, here. Um, let's look at just his feet. We're like bronze. Uh, these bronze feet signify his strength, where Jesus is going to be able to crush any opponents. He has stability in the context of his judgment. Look at Psalm 110, verse 1. This is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. In Hebrews 10, 13, he is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. You see that his feet will crush every opposing empire all throughout history here. And he's, he's making all of his enemies his footstool under those feet, the bronze feet. And then we have the voice. His voice is like that of, of the sound of cascading waters. This means that his announcements are powerful with a pervasive authority that echoes forth his majesty and sovereignty like the waves which continually crash against the rocks of Patmos. And so as you hear those waves, uh, we've all been to beaches here. His voice echoes and echoes and just has this pervasive authority. We're going to look at a few more verses here that, that echo this in the Old Testament. Daniel 10, 6 um, echoes quite a bit of what we've just read in Revelation 1, 14, 15. It says his body was like beryl, his face like the brilliance of lightning his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, same exact metal there, bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And so you, you can almost try to hear what these men are trying to describe. It, it's a very loud noise and it just sounds like a, a, you know, a whole crowd almost, but it sounds like cascading water, somewhere in between cascading waters and a multitude of people speaking. Let's look at some more Old Testament connections from Ezekiel. It says there, his voice was like the sound of cascading waters. In Ezekiel 124, um, he is speaking of the sound of the wings of these, these creatures like a huge torrent, like the voice of the Almighty. He's describing the noise of these animals similar to the voice of the Almighty, of, of Jesus, or of God the Father, perhaps. And it's the sound of a roar of a huge torrent of water, a lot of water running. Ezekiel 43, verse 2, I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. His voice sounded like the roar of a huge torrent, and the earth shone with his glory. And so we see these uh, images throughout the Bible. As we keep moving through, let's go into the seven stars that are in his right hand. We're going to talk about both of these. Uh, on the right hand in Scripture, the hand of authority and honor, it's the hand that possesses and protects his sheep. In John 10, 28, he says, I give them eternal life, 
They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And so in his hand, he's holding these seven stars. But what exactly are the seven stars? Well, again, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20 interprets what the seven stars are. We're going to talk about them a little bit later when we get into verse 20. But right now, um, let's just read verse 20 that's on the page here on the bottom. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so chapter 1, verse 20 interprets what the seven stars are. But we're going to dive into that and see uh, what a lot of scholars believe those could mean. And so with, let's keep moving. Verse 16, he had um, a, a sharp double-edged sword that came from his mouth. And so let's talk about the sword. It's a Thracian sword, a long, broad, and heavy, sharp on both sides. There are six swords mentioned in Revelation. And they're noted on your screen if you want to look them up. And if you're into swords, you can write those down and have some fun looking up some swords. Most scholars believe this is a reference to the Word of God. Jesus possesses perfect judgment from the Word of God, full of power and authority. God's Word searches the heart and judges rebels. And we know this verse very well. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is a living and effective. It's living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so we see this word coming from the Lord, Jesus. And so we see this. Let's look at another um, uh, Old Testament connection here. Isaiah 49, verse 2, he made my words like a sharp sword, and he hid me in the shadow of his hand. You, you see the connection in Isaiah to the hand and to the sword. In, in this verse, though, which some scholars believe helps us interpret Revelation, the words coming from Jesus's mouth are as sharp as a sword and, and are the word of God. They don't believe a literal sword is coming from his mouth, most scholars. It's, it's a reference and picture of the very word of God. So that's a, an Old Testament interpretation there that helps us interpret that verse possibly. Revelation 116, his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Wow. I mean, could you imagine staring and looking upon it? You, you wouldn't be able to take it. You'd have to uh, shield your eyes. You would have to look away. John saw the brilliance, the glory, holiness, majesty, and awesomeness of Jesus, much like his experience during the transfiguration. When John went up with Peter and James on the mountain and saw, and look at this verse from Matthew 17, verse 2. It's a connection verse. He was transfigured in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. This is the, the glorified Christ in all of his awesome brilliance and glory and honor and majesty. His clothes became white as the light. And so they got a little taste of that in the Gospels. And now John is beholding him um, fully here in his glory. And so as we keep uh, moving through here, uh, we have surveyed his features. We've seen his activity as Jesus has shown up. When Jesus showed up, shows up, number three, you want to steady all fears. Steady all fears and praise God, no matter what fears you're going through tonight, he's here, he's with us, he's among us. And look at what he says in this verse, verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and he said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. And so he, he fell at his feet like a dead man. John fell as dead, no laughing, no barking, no roaring, nothing silly as some Churches have had some really interesting experiences as they believe they're encountering the Lord. The Lord laid his, his right hand on me, the very gentle authority, placing his, his hand on John and just saying, don't be afraid. Stop being afraid, John. Uh, I'm the first and the last here. First is the protos in the Greek. Um, so we use that word all the time. Pro is, uh, means pre, it precedes words, protos first. And the last eschatos, we get the word eschatology. The study of last things is what we're really working through. It comes from the word last or eschatos in the Greek. God said, uh, said of God in Isaiah 44, verse 6 and elsewhere, that he alone is God, meaning that he's the first and the last. He's the absolute Lord, both of creation and of history. He starts and he finishes. He is before all, after all. All is under his sovereign control. So if you look at this verse, Isaiah 44, verse 6, this is what the Lord, the King of Israel, and its Redeemer, the Lord of armies, says, I'm the first and I'm the last. There's no God but me. So you can see that. And here's some more connections. Uh, I've already read the Isaiah 44, 6 in the, on this page. Look at the bottom one, Isaiah 48, verse 12. Listen to me, Jacob, 
in Israel, the one called by me, I am he, I'm the first and I'm also the last. This should give us great confidence not to be afraid. No matter which president is chosen, whichever president would give you the greatest fear that may you know, come into the White House in a few months, God is the first and the last. Christ is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, sovereign over all, and he is above all things. So no matter who gives you the greatest fear, take no fear when you are a Christian, don't be afraid, because your King of Kings, Lord of Lords is, is always reigning and is not weakened at all. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's our greatest hope. Our hope is not the Democrat party. Our hope is not the Republican party. Our hope is Jesus Christ. But we do vote, and I want you all to vote. And uh, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, and look to your true King and Lord, and that is Jesus. He says, uh, uh, and he is also he's the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. So paradoxically, here this ever living one died to redeem believers, and now lives forever as the firstborn of the dead. From verse five. Because Jesus died and rose again, John must fear not, and the churches should not fear death because Jesus has conquered it forever. Now, I got that from the ESV Study Bible, and I think it's just a very helpful point as we look at this. He says he holds the keys, the authority, the control, the access, but to what? To, to death and Hades. Um, Hades is the Greek word here, uh, but let's, let's just go here. The Old Testament reference that it's referring to is Sheol, meaning the grave, the place of all the dead, or a place of the wicked dead. And you see a lot of those uh, verses in the Old Testament. Death claims the body. Hades claims the soul. A lot of people connect Hades to, uh, to hell, um, but not unless Jesus says so. Why? Because he, he's the one that has the authority, the control, and the access over all of death and Hades. And so, the final two verses, therefore write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. This verse right here is the key that unlocks really the whole book. And, and we're looking at this book as a, the futurist look, that everything that uh, unfolds after chapter 3, so from chapter 4 to verse chapter 22, that's all going to take place in the future. And, and this verse is the key verse, verse 19. John, uh, write what you've seen, write what is, and write what will take place after this. And so our interpretation as we work through this book, we've talked at the preterist view, the historicist view, uh, you know, the, all the different views. We're looking at the futurist view as we move through the book. Let's go a little bit further as we look at some Old Testament uh, connections here. John, uh, write it down, what you've seen, what will take place after this. Daniel was told uh, what would happen in the last days. You see that when you read through Daniel. And the reveal of mysteries has let you know what will happen. I want you to know that we do not believe at our church what, we, what is called open theism, that the future is open. Uh, God knows all of the future. Nothing will catch him by surprise. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and he's sovereign above all time. And so nothing, nothing will surprise him, which is awesome and an awesome piece for us. If you look at the verse on the bottom, Daniel 2.45, the great God has told the king what will happen in the future. Only God knows what will happen in the future as he is the one over all, all things. Let's go into the mystery of the seven stars, because even though it says they are the angels of the seven churches, um, there is a bit of difference in interpretation that a lot of scholars have reached. So I'm going to share with you the four main views right now of the seven stars. Uh, the first one is that these are specific messengers from John to the seven churches. And they get that, the word angels in the Greek, angeloi, there, um, it can be translated messenger. And so they think these are just messengers from John to the seven churches. Uh, second view is specific messengers from the seven churches to John. The third view is the strongest view. I want you to know, just based on the straightforward reading of the Greek and of the verse, number three, these are guardian angels of the seven churches. These are angels who are guarding them. And then the, the interesting view that I don't agree with is pastors. These are the pastors. The seven stars are the are seven pastors of the churches. Even though I would, you know, I think that'd be kind of neat. I just don't buy it. But again, angels can be translated messengers. And so there are some interpreters that like to, to see that as possibly pastors. I think number three is the strongest view of, of the interpretation. And so it, it's fascinating because it makes one wonder. Um, we're told in, 
in Psalm 34 that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God and he delivers them. And so I think we each probably have angels that, that assist us that we can't see, that God dispatches to, to assist. And then I think our church, according to a passage like this, may have its own type of angel to guard the church. Who knows? But I think it's a wonderful thing to study and to wonder about. It's a whole realm of which we can go into. I want to close with this him here, just when I need him most, just when I need him, Jesus is near, just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most, just when I need him, Jesus is strong, bearing my burdens all the day long, for all my sorrow, giving a song, just when I need him most, just when I need him, he is my all, answering when upon him I call, tenderly watching lest I should fall, just when I need him most. And then just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. Perhaps you're watching this tonight and, and you're under great stress. Maybe you're under great guilt of sin. Maybe you've had the, the worst day or the worst week. You're, you're without a job. You're, you're in a hard spot. Christ is there. And when he appears and shows up, he is able to calm your heart and mine as he does. Well, let's run to him. Let's seek him. Let's look to him. And let's pray that as we keep going through everything we're going through, that we will encounter Christ in our hearts and our lives and in our church. Friends, that's it. That's the study for tonight. That is uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. And as we do that, that finishes out all of chapter 1. You have survived an entire chapter of Revelation. I hope that uh, as we went over all that, it wasn't too much and that you were able to kind of accept and receive some of the... Um, more difficult sections of that passage. It's my hope that as you pick up your Bible and read Revelation chapter one, that after tonight's study and last week's study, you're gonna have pretty good, uh, a pretty good feel for it. You're gonna think, man, I, I can kind of see what's going on. And I, I will say the next two chapters, as we look at the seven churches, there's not too much there that's gonna be difficult to grasp or understand. And then as we get beyond chapters two and three, we're going to get into some deeper woods, deeper territory. We're going to have some, a lot more uh, fun, different views to look at, similar to the seven stars that we had tonight. And so we do have a little bit of time. If you have a question, I want to ask if you might type it in the chat box, or you can unmute at this point. And if you want to uh, speak up and ask a question, feel free to do so from this passage. Let me just ask this, did, was it too much? Was it overwhelming? Because I know, again, that was a lot, or was everyone able to hang in? Everybody able, okay. I'm seeing a lot of thumbs. Okay, very good, guys. Very good. Um, so I know that, again, was a lot. I would encourage you to rewatch it and to download the notes and, and really study these things. So if there are no questions at all, do we have anyone that wants to turn in uh, any prayer needs for tonight that we might hear? And as we close out tonight, we'll close in prayer. So uh, here we go. Ah, uh, okay. Someone is asking the question, why do you find the number seven used so much? Last week in our study, I actually showed how many times seven shows up in the whole book, and it is a lot. And I'm not really a big pastor into like numerology stuff, but in the book and in apocalyptic literature, most scholars interpret the number seven as the number of God, the number of perfection, the number of completion. If you remember, God created the world not in six days, which was man's day, but in seven days. He rested on the seventh day, and it was the day of completion, the day of rest. And so there's, a, there's this uh, theme in scripture that seven is this perfect number of, of the Lord. And so as you read the book, Note them. There are so many sevens, even in chapter one. You got the seven lampstands, seven stars. I mean, there's quite a bit there as you go even through chapter one. Now, something that may fascinate you is when we were studying Greek in seminary, um, the first book they wanted us to interpret from the Greek into English was the book of Revelation. And even though the book may be a bit difficult to interpret, it's a very simple book in the Greek because it, it has so many repetitious words. It uses the same words over and over and over. And so for a first year Greek student, I think I have the first 12 to 15 chapters of Revelation. I have a really horrible translation, the Dave Crow translation that I had to do my second year in Greek. And, uh, but it was, you know, pretty easy. You, you learn somewhere around two to 300 words of Greek, and you can just about interpret from the Greek into English a lot of what's there. 
So very good question. Anyone else have another question they may want to ask? And then I think we are, yeah, we're good on some time. Um, anybody want to dive into the debate of the seven stars? Anyone think it's the pastors or anything other than, than angels? I think it's angels. So, uh, Pastor, I'll, I'll dive in there because it's going to be curious. We'll see how you do on, on chapters two and three when uh, the Lord tells them to write to the, to the, to the angel of, of a given church. And it's just curious to me why the Lord would need John or want John to write to an angel rather than writing to a messenger or to a pastor. Have any thoughts on that? Ooh, no, I, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful question. And, and so, Mike, my question back to you, do you believe that uh, maybe the pastor, that helps interpret that view of, of the pastor far better? Um, yeah, I kind of I kind of like that view. But again, you know, there's so many things that you know, we just have to be flexible as we go yeah. through the book of Revelation. I agree. Yeah, I would hate to split the church on this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, no, I agree with you. I think that's a wonderful question. And that's one I'm, I'm going to be jumping into over the next week. And so I may yield to that view after my study of it. Um, you know, I've, I've really just been, I've been doing antecedent studies or just studying up to the verse and trying my best to kind of look. Um, I'm not looking ahead much. So I think that's a wonderful question that I want to note and look at as I move forward. And then we'll, uh, we'll take a vote next week. So. <laughs> Another observation is that uh, with the Lord among the lampstands is a, an amazing view, in fact, unique to Revelation of one of his present ministries there in heaven. We get, we get views from other parts of scripture about him seated at the right hand of the throne of God as a high priest interceding for us and so forth. But uh, here we see him standing among the uh, lampstands. And so I, I think that's an interesting thought there and, and something to maybe even contemplate what his ministry among the churches and maybe even today would be. Amen. Amen. I think that's wonderful. I think when we you know, go through some of that um, over chapter two and three, we'll see what he's addressing in great detail and i'm certain whatever he's addressing there he's still addressing today in our churches but i love um i think something else i would add to that is there is a special presence of christ among his church that cannot be experienced apart from the church right and i, I love that one of the greatest things i ever hear from people that visit our church and i'll call our visitors i know sig and fred and other deacons you you've made these calls and I always ask what did you think of your visit and one of my favorite things I hear people say repeatedly is what I loved most is I really experienced God there. I felt the presence of Christ among your church. And, and I just, I love that. And I, I personally feel that when I'm in church, uh, I miss the choir, but there are so many moments when the choir will sing and it's just like, wow, the Lord is right here. You know, he is right in our midst and it is refreshing and amazing in a way that uh, as we've gone through six going on seven months of COVID, there's just no way, um, you know, and I'm thankful we have technology and we have YouTube, but there's no way to replace that special presence of the gathered saints, uh, you know, with, with what we have on YouTube. Um, so even though, you know, I know for safety, we have to do, many of us have to do that for a while. So thank you so much, Mike. Amen. Um, and I know how many of you really miss that? You're ready to get back in the church and get back in the, yeah, in the room and hear the sound of the singing of the room. We have so many songs that Rick will lead us in where I'll, I'll just stop singing, just listen to everyone singing, and it just gets me right in the right place where I'm ready to preach and, and charge like the Kool-Aid man through a wall. I love it. <laughs> so, um, all right. Anyone else have a comment or question? And then uh, we will close with a bit of prayer. And I just uh, appreciate everybody for tuning in tonight. I hope you keep tuning in. You're blessed if you hear the reading of it and, and study this book. So um, after last night's debate, we all need a blessing, don't we? We all need, we all need a yeah, soul cleansed. I was watching that just with my kids and I was like, sons, I'm so sorry. Like I am just, I, you know, America lost tonight. No one won this thing. America lost. And I felt like it was the judgment of God on us, you know, just watching that debate fold, unfold. Um, I know that sounds sad, and, and but it was. It just did not, it was not a fun moment for American history. So on that awful note, uh, let me pray for us. Oh, Fred, I see your finger. 
Yeah. One, one little comment. Uh, early on, you talked about the, the appearance of Jesus. And I don't have any insight on that either. But I do know from, from, from reading that Jesus must have been a man's man because he worked with his father in the, in the carpenter shop. Amen. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he was definitely a man's man. Yeah, he was not blonde haired and blue eyed as uh, a lot of paintings depict him. He was Middle Eastern. He was Jewish. You know, he was, um, you know, definitely a man of that region. I think when I study Isaiah, I think what Isaiah says of him as well is there's nothing about him that would make us, you know, desire to be, you know, to look like him. He may have not been a very handsome man, you know, according to Isaiah's depiction. But most interpret what Isaiah was saying as, as how disfigured he became when he was beaten. And that he was so despised and so beaten for our sins that he was surely something that no one would you know, want to become like that. Um, so there's just not much. There's not much written in the Gospels about what he exactly looked like. Um, and it's, it's texts like this that really don't help. It's like, okay, lightning and sun, that, that's okay. Um, you know, yeah, I still have no idea. You know, I'm not seeing the image. So uh, Mike Schmidt. Just one other comment here. I love this in the passage here in Revelation because it tells us he didn't leave his humanity behind when he ascended into heaven. That's and, true. And he'll forever, for eternity, be identified with mankind in his humanity as well as in his deity. Amen. Uh, I believe we'll see the wounds when we go to heaven. You know, just like Thomas saw them after the resurrection. That was his resurrected body. I think the Gospels give us the clearest picture, and then what John has here is he's ascended now. He's in, he's been in the presence of the Father, so of course he's glowing like Moses. His face glowed when he spent some time in the presence of God, and had to wear a veil. Um, you know, but Amen. He is 100% God, 100% man, and we will be encountering him as such throughout eternity. So I think that is a wonderful thing to point out. He did not ascend into heaven as a spirit. If he did do that, his body would still be on the earth somewhere. And that would mean the Romans could have paraded his, his carcass and there wouldn't have been really a risen Jesus. So we believe he ascended bodily and he will return bodily with power. That's a big part of our doctrine. Sig Nephew. Well, uh, when you talk about uh, what he looked like, uh, do you remember he said to, was it John? Um, uh, I go to prepare a place for you and you, you'll be there with me. And he said, well, I don't know that. And he says, well, uh, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. And of course, uh, people uh, tend to say, well, exactly what did he look like? Was he black? Was he white? Was he red? Was he, and, and I say, it's not the outside looks, it's the attributes of him. And I think that's what they're trying to tell him is that, that he didn't want to uh, draw a, a attention to his outside, you know, shining like the sun, or something, uh, he wanted people to uh, listen to his words because the words were life, not what he looked like. Amen. Amen. I think if it were important to have that, they would have recorded it somewhere, you know, and, and done like a, you know, he had a, a striking nose, you know, or whatever, given us a play by play. So we are given in scripture and we will see him. Amen. We will, we will know one day what he sure. looks like. Amen. And now that I'm ready for that. We could see that tonight. Wouldn't that be great if we didn't even have to vote? We could just, we just go home. We can just be with Christ and, and just have to, you know, move out of all of this crazy. The COVID is over. No more sickness. All of it's over. I would love it. Um, and then we would all, with this mystery would be solved. We would know who, what he looks like.